Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! A Marine serving a life sentence for the murder of an injured Afghan fighter has been refused bail pending a rehearing of his trial. Sergeant Alexander Blackman had his case referred for appeal after new evidence came to light about his mental health at the time of the killing. But tonight this programme has new testimony from his former commanding officer in Helmand. He tells us of his warnings about the wider unit that went unheeded and speaks of a lack of leadership leading up to the Blackman killing. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, has this exclusive report. So the campaign to free Sergeant Alexander Blackman will now go on through another Christmas. We are obviously disappointed by the judge's decision not to grant bail this afternoon. However, we must remember that earlier this month, the Criminal Cases Review Commission decided to refer the case back to the appeal courts. No family reunion possible, of course, for the family of the wounded Afghan prisoner whom Blackman murdered. Tonight, the wider truth about this murder can be told for the first time, and it suggests that not just one man, but a whole unit had gone rogue and was effectively out of control. The senior commanders of the Royal Marines were warned about this time and again before the murder happened, but no changes were made of any significance. And when proceedings were taken against the officer concerned in the murder, those who'd made criticisms, those who'd issued the warnings, were effectively silenced until now. Royal Marines in southern Afghanistan in July 2011. By September, commanders had been repeatedly warned that elements of 4-2 commando had gone rogue, out of control. On September the 15th, that ended in the murder of an Afghan prisoner lying on the ground seriously wounded. The Marine's helmet camera recorded Sergeant Blackman as he shot dead the prisoner. Hey, I'll shuffle off this mortal call, you There's Nothing you would do to us. I know. Exactly. Obviously, this doesn't go anywhere, fellas. Yeah, Roger, mate. I've just broken the Geneva Convention. Yeah, Roger. For that, Sergeant Alexander Blackman was sentenced to 10 years for murder at a court-martial. You are at the moment achieving mission success in Nad Ali South. Briefing his men, Blackman's commanding officer at the time of the murder in Afghanistan, Colonel Oliver Lee, he had warned his superiors Blackman's unit was a problem. Nothing happened. Lee was the youngest Marine colonel appointed since World War II. He loved the Marines. He still does. Tonight, in his first TV interview, he charts the story the court-martial never heard. The failure of one man and one unit, yes, but far wider failure of senior command. You have got to put men and lead men into a situation where they may be shooting people one minute and five minutes later called upon to administer life saving first aid to those same people. I think that's a very reasonable characterization of it. That requires um, exceptionally disciplined soldiering and very strong leadership to enable that soldiering. And very sadly, I feel that at a series of levels above Sergeant Blackman, that sort of leadership was absent. At the time, Colonel Lee was so concerned, he and others warned senior officers. I was concerned about what was going on in that area and I had made those concerns clear. Colonel Lee wasn't alone. The internal report into the murder cites... 4-2 Commando's culture was perceived by many to be overly aggressive. Moral disengagement of Sergeant Blackman and the members of his multiple. They were showing evidence of moral regression, psychological strain and fatigue. And... Sergeant Blackman allowed professional standards to slip to an unacceptably low level. I simply felt that the, the needs of the campaign at that particular moment in time, sophisticated level of counterinsurgency, didn't appear evident to me. It was quite serious. I mean, the report that, that you'll be aware of, uh, uh, of course, describes them as being uh, morally degenerate, being overly aggressive, uh, effectively a rogue unit. Would you accept or would you recognise that characterisation? Is it right? 
Um, I mean, I broadly speaking recognise that characterisation, yes. I, I felt that the certain elements of the unit that I uh, came to command right at the end of the tour were not operating in a manner that I would have wished to see them operating in. And I felt that that, in relative terms, increased the chances of a Sergeant Blackman type event taking place. And you warned and the, them about that in uh, advance, didn't you? Uh, not in so many words, but yes, I did. You um, said there was I a problem. I raised concerns about what was happening in that particular area in advance. Yes, that's entirely right. Another Royal Marine close to that unit told Channel 4 News they were a unit of the past. It was all about getting the rounds down, smashing the enemy. Counterinsurgency wasn't mentioned. And he too had warned commanders these guys are going feral. But once Sergeant Blackman was arrested, Colonel Lee knew what would naturally happen, or thought he knew. I would characterise myself as an absolutely key element of the line management, and I have always been and will remain baffled, therefore, that I wasn't included in the proceedings against him. What? They didn't ask you? No, I wasn't asked to participate in those proceedings at any point. Uh, in spite of the fact that on a number of occasions, formally and otherwise, I attempted to become involved in them. Hang on, a key soldier is going down for murdering a POW in cold blood. You're his line manager and you're not asked to be involved in the investigation. That's bizarre. Uh, I too think that's extremely bizarre. Some would suggest it was a cover-up. Others who had warned about the unit were also not allowed to give evidence at the court-martial. Colonel Lee only found out that it was happening from the media. And that was the last straw he resigned from his beloved Marines. That seemed to me in an organisation that absolutely fundamentally relies on the, what I describe as sacrosanct relationship between command and commanded. It seemed like a, a serious breakdown of that relationship and I didn't find that able to be tolerated. Oliver Lee's spoken out today in the hope that the organisation he still loves can learn tough lessons about the pressures counterinsurgency places on leaders as well as lead. This is an incredibly sad event, but it's, it's not an event that you know, unpicks 350 years worth of highly distinguished history. My sad suspicion is that the battlefields of the future will only become more complex and difficult uh, than those of today, and goodness me, aren't they complex and difficult? And so the premium associated with learning lessons from this sort of case simply could not be higher. Tonight the MOD claimed they could not comment on a live legal case. When Oliver Lee was in Afghanistan, ISIS was just an Egyptian goddess. Times and challenges develop rapidly in war. Command structures must be up to the job, and that, Colonel Lee suggests, is what this sorry episode is all about. Alex Thompson reporting there. Well, I'm joined now by the lawyer and former Army Captain Patrick Hennessy, who served in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Welcome to the programme. So, we heard there, I mean, obviously, um, the wife's very disappointed, many soldiers, senior officers also disappointed by today's ruling. Mm. Do you understand where they're coming from with their disappointment, or do you think they should have just taken this for granted? I can see where they're coming from with their disappointment. I'm not a criminal lawyer, so the exact conditions over which bail are granted are not my area. Mm -hmm. um, but it does seem that the Crown was not opposing the idea of bail and maybe there could have been exceptional circumstances. But I think that's a very narrow element of actually what's a much more um, complex, as you, as you heard there mm. from, from the former commanding officer, a much more tricky issue, which is about the relationship between the stresses of being... Uh, in conflict and how the legal structures apply to that. So, I mean, the argument in favour of Colonel uh, uh, Blackman is essentially that he, uh, you know, the stresses of war are so different. Civilians don't really understand that we have to make special allowances for soldiers in those sort of situations. Is that the right way to go? Is that, is that fair? I, I think it's fair to say that the stresses of combat are different. Um, but I think what happened in this case, and, and as, as the MOD statement said, you don't want to prejudge what the Court of Appeal is going to say. There's clearly new psychiatric evidence. But my starting point for this has to be that we've all heard the audio of the gunshot that kills this injured Taliban fighter. The unit are not in contact. They're not being fired upon. There's no suggestion that that wounded person uh, is about to attack them. And very calmly, um, Sam Blackman says, don't say anyone, I've done that because I've just broken the law. Mm. Now, I think it's a very 
difficult circumstance. It's very difficult for anyone who hasn't been in that situation to say what the rights and wrongs are. But you have to be uh, almost whiter than white when you're prosecuting yeah. a military conflict like that. But also, I mean, we are, you know, we're constantly going on about Assad and his alleged war crimes. How can we possibly point the finger at someone like him if we're allowing someone like uh, Mr Blackburn to basically tear up the Geneva Convention on tape in the battlefield and get away with it? Well, I, I think that's why... So far, I wouldn't criticise any of the steps that have been taken. Now, if the Court of Appeal looks at this and says, OK, well, there was material that wasn't before the court-martial and we're going to revise our sentencing, that is one thing. But I think we are still dealing in this country, and the British military is still dealing with the terrible legacy of Baha Musa, and every scurrilous claim that has come before the Iraq Historical Allegations Tribunal is lent credibility that it wouldn't otherwise have, because on our watch, a heinous crime was committed, and we didn't come down hard upon it. Now, this is a very similar situation. The flip side, there are a lot of people saying, oh, well, he should have been let off, or different standards should have been applied. Well, look at it through the filter, as you say. What, what would you say to people who say, well, hang on, what just occurred on the battlefield? So and why how do you accepted? explain the Daily Mail's campaign? Because um, this is quite extraordinary. There have been sort of similar cases in the past, but this campaign, waged mainly by the Daily Mail, but also by a lot of people in, 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 in military circles, is, is unprecedented, isn't it? How do you explain it? Well, I, I think it's got huge popular support, and I can understand why that is, because there is support for the men and women of our armed forces who do a very difficult job. If one was being cynical, you'd, you'd point to the irony that the male, which is usually keen on locking them away and throwing away the key, is mm. now suddenly the, the voice of clemency. Um, and, and they're very good at riding um, public opinion and slightly forming it. But, but there's also another consideration, which is if the appeal is successful on the basis that there was diminished responsibility, this is manslaughter, not murder, that creates a potentially very dangerous precedent mm. for every subsequent action that happens on a battlefield because battlefields are inherently stressful places. Patrick Hennessy, thanks very much.